Good evening, everyone. Please take your seats, get out your notebooks, and focus. It's time to put on your thinking caps and explore Hudson Valley history. So call in and let's talk history with Ms. Lorenzo. The number is 845-553-9606. Class is now in session at HudsonRiverRadio.com. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to HudsonRiverRadio.com and Let's Talk History. I'm your host, Jennifer Lorenzo, and we are so happy to welcome back esteemed historian James Kirby Martin. He's here to discuss the newly released documentary, Benedict Arnold, Hero Betrayed. So, uh, Jim, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you in turn. It's my pleasure to be with you, uh, Jennifer, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. I am as well. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about your background? We originally met at the uh, Fort Ticonderoga Teacher Institute, um, but you also have a professorship and all kinds of other good history behind you. So what's your background in history? Well, my background is is that I've had a PhD longer than I care, care to remember, going back to my school days at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And uh, over the years, I've taught at uh, Rutgers University in New Jersey, uh, the University of Houston. I actually spent a semester as a visiting professor at the Citadel uh, in South Carolina. And then the last year before I actually retired formally from academic teaching, I was spent at the United States Military Academy right up the road from you uh, at West Point. So I've been kind of all over the place and put in a lot of time in the classroom. And now I'm enjoying my life as an emeritus professor. And I guess that really means I've been put out to pasture, but I haven't let myself get completely put out because I keep working on book and uh, television movie, movie projects, as a matter of fact. Lucky for us. And not only with that role, more people get to experience your, your scholarship because it's not just your students in the classroom, the whole public and the whole world can now experience it. So that's, that's our benefit. So. Well, thank you. For- I'm, I'm going to keep churning it out until I get churned out, I guess is, is the way to put it. Well, uh, I, and- you, you've put out great scholarship. So thank you very much. So speaking of scholarship, what is your interest in Benedict Arnold? Because one of the teacher institutes um, that I attended with you was all about Benedict Arnold. So what is your interest in Benedict Arnold? Well, my interest in uh, uh, Benedict Arnold goes back a long way. And, and sometimes I say all the way back to my childhood when I first took history in the fourth grade um, back in northern Ohio. And as a little boy, I, I was told that revolution was sort of this amazing mo- morality play, and there were good people and there were bad people. And it seemed like all the good people were on the American side and all the bad people were on the British side. We all know that's an oversimplification. Right. Uh, but that was sort of the way it was presented. And of course, the number one good person at the time was, was George Washington, whom I greatly admire. Very, very talented. His contributions to this country absolutely are absolutely immense. But on the bad guy side, it was Benedict Arnold. So that if Washington was the essence of all good virtue in society, Arnold in turn was the essence of more or less, almost it was being presented as if the devil had gotten loose in the land and somehow had, for whatever reason, had taken this man and turned him into this terrible, terrible patriot who gave up on the cause and committed treason and went back over to the British. Um, Actually, he did in 1780, but not necessarily for those reasons. Right. So now the, the, title of the documentary is Benedict Arnold Hero Betrayed. And we're going to get more about the documentary a little bit later. But just to let our listeners know, what was your role in the documentary? Well, my role began 20 years ago, as a matter of fact. And uh, uh, the gentleman who produced the uh, documentary, all from the Saratoga, New York area, uh, and they'll, they would say if they were here that uh, they always had this interest in this guy, Arnold, because he was talked about so much uh, in their childhoods and as they were growing up. They contacted me. I was actually on some sort of a research trip in New York City. And they contacted me and we got together. And we had a discussion. They uh, basically said, we want to tell the Arnold story and we think your book does it. And uh, so I gave them permission to begin to build the script as they have done. And 
have completed around my Benedict Arnold Revolutionary Hero book, which really does concentrate on Arnold as a very, very talented and successful American officer before he decides to go back over to the British. But that's, that's part of it. So that was the connection. And then over the years, I did a whole variety of things, everything from helping to locate historians who could talk to the various issues to um, actually two or three times I appeared in scenes, but you couldn't tell it was me because, <laughs> because I was a talking head at the same time. In fact, if you want to see me at a much younger point in my life uh, with a lot, I should say my hair is not quite as gray as it is today. I'm there and I do appear in the film uh, uh, quite often. And then also because of all the activity I was involved in, I, I served as an executive producer of the film. So I had multiple roles would be the way to describe it. And uh, in the end, I'm very happy, very satisfied. It took us a long time, but I think we produced a really a very, very good two-hour television documentary. Great. And where can listeners view the documentary? Well, there are various sites, and this, this list will continue to expand. But right now, Amazon Prime, um, uh, Voodoo, um, I'm trying to give you some of the others. Uh, I've sort of had them memorized, and now they kind of fly out of my brain. But uh, um, uh, Well, those are two good places. I think a lot of people okay. have Amazon Prime, so I think... Right. Well, that's, that's probably the most most notable one. But Roku's one, um, and uh, there's, there's some others along that particular line. In fact... Uh, I think iTunes and Vimeo also? Yes, iTunes, Vimeo, that's right. All these good things that I... <laughs> Suddenly can't remember. That's okay. And to me, if it's not, uh, I'm more now into the the Amazon Prime and all that because there's so many good things on Amazon Prime. But that's right. Growing up, it was two four seven. You know, so even to me, sometimes these new fangled things, I have to write them down. Otherwise, you know, they they go right out the. Right, and one of the things that I could point out uh, is that the way television is constructed. Uh, and given the COVID epidemic, um, more and more things are appearing on television on these uh, various channels. Absolutely. That are and I think that you can say the whole thing is the whole process of viewing is now changing very, very dramatically. And uh, it's just something to be it's something to be aware of. Absolutely. In the old days, we went to the movie theater. Yes. Maybe some people still go to the movie theater, but a lot more people just turn on their television with these beautiful sets that we have today. And compare it with the first TV that I saw as a little kid, which was a 13-inch screen with a bubble on it. It was all black and white. And Well, we just watched the screen and hope we can understand what was going on. So right. So much, it's so much better today. It's almost like everybody now can have a theater in their home. Right. And it's at your fingertips. You decide you want to watch, you just go into your Amazon Prime account or your iTunes account, and it's right, right. there, you know, and digital. That's and right. for the classroom, it's great because you just log on from the classroom. You don't have to worry about getting a DVD player or, you know, the old film strip machine. It's, it's all at your fingertips. So cutting right. edge. Right. Streaming services are the trend. Absolutely. Okay, put, it that, put it that way. Absolutely. So now getting back to the, the documentary, which can be found on all those streaming services, um, you've said that Arnold, the Arnold story is at the core of developing a deepened and enriched understanding of what the American Revolution is all about. What do you mean by that quote? Well, I think the best way for me to summarize that without blabbing on endlessly is to point out that for many of us, when we first learned about the American Revolution, we did learn about it as a morality play of good guys against bad guys of a population coming together in 1775, 1776, sort of linking arms and for eight long years of war, doing everything they could uh, short of giving up their lives to um, support the cause and bring about the great victory over uh, what was perceived, and I learned, a more powerful British Empire. That's even debatable in terms of military affairs as we learn more about the revolution. But that's sort of the structure. And what I really mean by that statement is when you get in there and you start doing real research, when you go to the archives, when you start reading all the information that is out there and available, that picture begins to break down. It isn't that simple kind of a pattern. Give you one kind of an example. Uh, and that is, I think we know today, it's fair to say that even at the outset of the war, 
maybe 25% of the people were really committed patriots, that is, committed re rebels. Probably 25% on the other side uh, were loyalists. They didn't want to break up from the British Empire. They thought it was a good deal living as part of this very amazingly strong and powerful empire. And then you got about 50% in the middle, and it's sort of like the the line goes, as a gentleman from Philadelphia said, let who would be king? I'm still going to be a subject. Mm. Um, and so you guys get it decided and let me know how it all turns out. And that brings a new kind of reality, which helps us then understand characters like Benedict Arnold. He was not the only person who would go back and forth. Uh, he was not the only person who would contribute so much on one side only to try to break it apart on the other side. Uh, and what he does, in essence, um, in this rather complex and amazing, amazingly meaningful life that he led, he sort of instructs us about this kind of a real reality of the revolution, if I could put it that way. Excellent. Sounds good. So now getting back to his early childhood, what can you tell us about Benedict Arnold's childhood and his family life? Well, there are two childhoods. There's the one that he lived um, and there was the one that was made up about him. And that's what I learned as a researcher because uh, one of my, in my graduate school training, my mentor, a wonderful man named Merrill Jensen, go to the archives, go to the archives, go to the archives. You're never going to get out of here if you don't go to the archives and do real research. Uh, and I, I, with Arnold, I, you know, and with all my projects, I try to do this. And uh, for instance, I found letters uh, uh, that were written in the 1820s uh, and uh, in, in Harvard, Car uh, Harvard College uh, collections uh, that were directed to a man by the name of Jared Sparks. Jared Sparks was a enthusiastic historian of the revolution, did some amazing work, wrote the first Benedict Arnold biography, and he didn't know anything about Arnold's childhood. So oh. he wrote friends and said, hey, who grew up around Arnold in Norwich and knew him in New Haven, or at least they alleged they alleged they did. Tell me about this guy. Well, they didn't know anything either. So they just made up some great stories. You know, <laughs> and I, I'm not going to give them all to you, but I'll give you a couple. You know, that Arnold was this nasty little boy, he liked to climb trees and break the necks of baby birds. Uh, he liked to spread glass along the walkway when the little kitties were going to school. He was a bad guy. Um, he liked to jump up on tables during thunderstorms and scream to the devil. Uh, and these stories worked their way into the Arnold Annia, that is, the, the books that were written, and they get repeated and repeated and repeated, almost literally down to our own time. In fact, a couple of recent efforts actually drawn some of this stuff. I guess they didn't read my biography. Uh, but um, the, the point is, this is made up. This is a made up. I call them the Arnold tales or the Arnold myths. The real Arnold did not leave much of a record. He said in midlife that he remembers himself as pretty much a coward until the age of 16. Hmm. Why would he say something like that? It's because that was what his experience. He grew up in a very nice family, very distinguished family. It had been eminent. One of his forebears was the governor of Rhode Island following uh, the famous Roger Williams. The family was sort of on the skids, but his father brought the family back in Norwich uh, uh, as a, a successful merchant, but then a disaster hit. And that disaster was uh, really what affected him greatly, I think, through his life because a uh, diphtheria epidemic broke out. You know, you can't breathe. Think about COVID, you know, and everything like that. Right. Um, and uh, today, and anyway, three of the family children of the five, died during that period. The father almost died. This family was shattered by this. The father began to lose his way. And as we know, he basically became an alcoholic. That's how he dealt with the tragedy of losing a family. Huh. And that caused all sorts of problems. He was almost excommunicated from the local church, the local congregational church. Uh, the family went on the skids. Arnold is being judged of, well, your, your old man's a drunk you're probably a future one, that sort of thing. And Arnold begins to develop a very keen sense of his, his personal honor. And he also begins also to develop a sense of arbitrary power that he resents. 
In this case, the arbitrary power is the community casting aspersions on his family. Another form of arbitrary power would be that disease. And his mother is writing him letters, which we have copies of. And these letters are saying, prepare yourself because God could strike you dead at any moment. Oh my goodness. A very harsh Calvinistic approach uh, to religious feeling. And all you have to do is translate that sensitivity about arbitrary power uh, into the years 1760s and 1770s, when he's now a very successful young merchant thriving in New Haven, Connecticut. And he begins to see a new form of arbitrary power, and that is the British who are trying through taxation and other means to sort of control American trade, bring the colonists into line. And, he's, and he really break out in the early 1770s as an outspoken leader locally in the New Haven, in the Connecticut area, speaking out in favor of we must defend our rights, we must defend our liberties, or we could be facing real tyranny in our lives, that is arbitrary power. So that's a way to get at his childhood and his young adulthood. So it seems like he had a lot to overcome during that, that time period. I think that's fair. That, that, is, that is correct. And when he, when he did overcome it, he threw himself. I mean, he threw himself into the uh, rebellion. He helped organize a militia regiment in New Haven, the second company of foot guards. He became the captain. For one reason he became captain, he organized it. He put his own time. He was involved in helping to buy uniforms for those young men who signed up. And, and he had Yale College was right there. Uh, and uh, he drew some students out of Yale College and got them to join up. So he's early on. I mean, he hears about Lexington and Concord and boom, he gets his, reg I mean, his company organized and they, he marches them off to the area around Boston after uh, those battles after the 19th of April. And he's in it. And he's in it uh, in amazing ways uh, after uh, this outbreak of fighting uh, in April of 1775. Did he have much military training? Where did he get his training and experience? That's one of the most interesting things about Arnold. He had fundamentally no military training. His military training was in the sense that he became a carrying merchant in the 1760s. He owned, uh, with, in partnership with others, a series of vessels. He would command those vessels at sea. He would trade into the West Indies, and he had to manage crews. I mean, that's sort of like a military discipline kind of a situation. Man managed the crews. He, he traded all the way up into Quebec City area. He traded down into various ports in the West Indies. Uh, and so that's a form of training. In terms of actual military service, uh, another legend is, is that he kept signing up during the French and Indian War uh, and that he would take the bounty money and then rush home with it and then he'd squander it and he'd rush back and sign up again. Well, this stuff is nonsense. It's not true. What is true is, is that in 1757, uh, during the French and Indian War, an army drops out of Canada, French and Indian force, and uh, it begins to threaten the Lake Champlain area and does actually threaten Lake George and knocks out a fort at the bottom of Lake George. And at that point, the local militias in Connecticut and Massachusetts rally. So Arnold had about two weeks of militia service. Wow. That was the extent of his military training at the age of 16, as a matter of fact. So what is amazing is this guy's a natural born military talent, even though some people don't want me to say that. That's a fact. And he he can he, he not only fights on land, but becomes a leader. Washington says he's my best fighting general. But Arnold also will take command of the fleet on Lake Champlain and help delay the British sending an army out of Canada to attack the New England colonies from behind. He could fight on land, or I should say command, he could command on land, he could command on sea. And from that point of view, he really is a remarkable military leader. Now, that's not perfect. I don't want to say that. Uh, a lot of people did not like Arnold. Uh, he does operate with a chip on his shoulder. Uh, let me put it this way, and he was surrounded by many. He does not suffer fools lightly <laughs> because he has this commander mentality. Right. I'm not going to put up. You're ridiculous, and I won't name some names, uh, but uh, uh some of them are fairly well-known leaders in the revolution, but they didn't like him. And furthermore, they were jealous of him. Why? Because he was the guy Washington said, he's my best. I trust this guy. It will give him det detached commands. That is literally 
Arnold would be sent out on missions because Washington was sure that Arnold could handle the situation, unlike many of his generals that Arnold sort of treated like, you know, a little flock around, I mean, I'm not said Arnold, I mean Washington, treated like a little flock around him uh, because he couldn't fully trust them that they would show good judgment in dealing with uh, combat situations. So I think that's a great place to take our first break. We come back and we'll start talking about the the two episodes of the the documentary. So we're again joined by esteemed historian James Kirby Martin talking about the newly released documentary, Benedict Arnold, Hero Betrayed. And we'll be right back after these messages. HudsonRiverRadio.com Did you know that there have been over 30,000 reported cases of UFOs in the Hudson Valley? What happens to people when they have very close encounters and missing time? I'm Linda Zimmerman. I'm Michael Warden. Join us for UFO Headquarters. We'll dig into some of the most intense and unnerving UFO sightings that happened right here in our backyard. UFO Headquarters on HudsonRiverRadio.com And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast in our app or on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to UFO Headquarters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts. Finding the right person for the job isn't easy. Just ask someone who hired a lounge singer to be their office receptionist. Hello, this is Mickey Marquis, and you've reached the office of Doug & Associates. <laughs> Thank you very much. Catch me Tuesday nights at the Hotel Johnson. Hello? But if you've got an insurance question, you can always count on your local GEICO agent. They can bundle your policies, which could save you hundreds. Doug and Associates, this is Mickey Market. Hello? For expert help with all your insurance needs, visit geico.com slash local today. Hi, this is Big Jim Wheeler. You know, I grew up on a farm as a kid. and Well, back in those days, we didn't have much TV to watch. So as a family, we'd sit around the radio and we'd listen to those old shows. Well, I've become a huge fan of those classic radio shows, and I'm thrilled to share my personal collection of original broadcast recordings with you. Well, we got old Western superheroes, classic stories. Oh, we got them all. Check out Hudson River Radio's Classic Radio Theater. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you'll never miss a show. This is Big Jim Wheeler signing off and hoping you enjoy the show. Subscribe to Classic Radio Theater on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts. HudsonRiverRadio.com Welcome back to HudsonRiverRadio.com and Let's Talk History. I'm your host, Jennifer Lorenzo. And again, we're joined by historian James Kirby Martin. And he's discussing the newly released documentary benedict arnold hero betrayed so again jim thank you so much and thanks for joining us again here on uh let's talk history very glad to be with you so episode one is titled hero and it's the untold story of benedict arnold can you elaborate on that title and you touched upon a little bit about his experience in uh the champlain area and ticonderoga but what including valcor island and ticonderoga are involved in chapter episode one well, I'll tell you, that is one of the most important parts of the whole story because, let me put it this way, traditionally when we study the Revolutionary War, we tend to focus on George Washington, but the war is not only in the middle colonies. Uh, the war is fought all the way up into Canada, and eventually later on it'll be fought, well, it'll be fought in the South as well. And so there is more than one Continental Army. There is the so-called Northern, it's not so-called, it was called the Northern Department. Uh, and Arnold emerges as the premier player in invading Quebec province, uh, Canada, in 1775. Uh, and he's, heavily, he's involved in an attempt to take Quebec City to bring the Quebec province in, in as the 14th colony in rebellion to close that natural highway from a strategic point of view that is sending British forces to uh, up, the, up the St. Lawrence River all the way to Montreal then dropping them down through Lake Champlain and cutting off New England when you take Lake Champlain and you begin to control the Hudson River. So Arnold's 
career as a military officer for the Americans really focuses mostly on this particular area, not completely. And so Arnold is involved in the attempt to take Quebec, the failure, the retreat out of Canada in 1776, uh, the decision to make a stand on Lake Champlain where he becomes the commodore of a fleet that uh, of vessels that will take on far superior British forces and uh, naval forces coming out of Canada will lead to the Battle of Valcour Island, one of the most important, October 11th, 1776. Arnold's in command and he will help convince the British they can't get all the way south. They can't get all the way to Fort Ticonderoga or even to Albany. So this delay, uh, even though Arnold will use up the fleet, will lead to a further British attempt in 1777. And once again, Arnold is involved. And we're talking about the two great battles of Saratoga, the army of gen gentlemen or general, sometimes called gentlemen, but general uh, Johnny Burgoyne will be captured in two battles. Arnold's in the forefront of the battles. Along the way in all of this, he's wounded twice. He's wounded seriously at uh, Saratoga. Uh, he's mangled his left leg. Horse falls down on top of him. Uh, he's, and, and, so, and so he really takes a physical beating in supporting the American cause. He, he will say, I fought and I bled and I contributed. And I don't think in the end I'm being treated very well. And I think that kind of leads us to our, our next question, because you mentioned how he was injured in battle. And so the repercussions of his actions in Saratoga, like you said, where he, he didn't feel like he was being um, appreciated for his actions there and his injury. Uh, so after that, it kind of leads us to ask what led him to the British side? Well, uh, let me state this at the outset. In most Arnold treatments, uh, the writers, the authors look backward through the trees and then they go hunt and pick for reasons why Arnold did what he did. And they tend to neglect this brilliant military career in the process. What we try to do in the documentary is look at it from Arnold's point of view. We don't live our lives backward. We live them forward. Arnold didn't know when he was two that he was going to quote unquote commit treason. Um, he, he led a very kind of interesting uh, childhood, difficult childhood. Uh, he was very successful all the way through. But, he, but there's this problem again about arbitrary power that I mentioned earlier. And he begins in 1776 because of the retreat from Canada to doubt the continent. Why aren't they really supporting us? We're up here in Canada. Why are we doing more? To really, why aren't the American people? He begins to criticize. Why is the, the, the civilian population helping, uh, helping us out? He begins to have doubt. And then he, he, he gets involved in uh, defending Lake Champlain and putting this fleet together. And they have all sorts of supply shortages. It's all they can do to put a little fleet together. And amazingly, it very successfully will stand up to far superior British forces, at least help scare them off. And he's being told at the time people are in the Continental Congress complaining about him, which is huh. uh, really ridiculous. Your best friends aren't your countrymen. He gets a letter like that. Wow. And he's what's he doing? He's out in the middle of a lake trying to defend and people are complaining about him and it behind his back. Well, he did this and he did that. And he looks side crossways at me and he made me feel bad. And uh, he probably told me I was an idiot and probably he told them the truth when he said that. And... <clears throat> Anyway, it's a matter of growing doubt. Then after that wounding, that's when I believe you start to see a real change in him. This is in October of 1777 in the Second Battle of Saratoga. He's hauled off. He doesn't get the glory. They give the glory to Horatio Gates. Gates really wasn't the key in the command, but he was an overall command. Congress honors Gates uh, in, in all sorts of ways. They sort of, well, thanks, Ben, kind of approach to him. He's writhing in pain in a military hospital. They're threatening to cut off his leg. It goes on and on and on from there. And you can see creeping disillusionment beginning to become a pattern of a little bit of bitterness here and a little bit of bitterness there. And that's really what is going on. Arnold writes a letter to Washington. And by the way, this also had to do with his rank because he'd been passed over for rank when Washington 
I couldn't believe it. Washington is the best guy I got. You wouldn't promote him? You don't have anybody any better? But right. the politicians are doing what? They're playing politics. I don't want to shock people when I tell them that. <laughs> I'm sure our politicians today would never play politics. Never. <laughs> but but, but uh, anyway, anyway. The, the point is, they are naming people over him that are vastly inferior to him in rank and in ability. Oh, we need one from Pennsylvania. We need one from Massachusetts. We need one from wherever it is. And so Arnold has passed over, and this is a thoroughgoing insult to his honor, to his respect. And so he says, if you can't straighten this out, I'm going to resign. And he actually did resign, but his letter is pulled off the table because Washington asks. He resigned to Congress. Washington asked, please go and help us stop General Burgoyne. And he did it more or less as a favor to his, at that point, good friend, George Washington. Then, of course, now he's wounded. Washington will write him a letter and say, Congress has finally restored your seniority. You're now ranking over these guys. And Arnold really doesn't respond quickly. He's in thoroughly insulted and what he does, he writes a letter to Washington. I find it very, very, and this is in the spring of 1778, two years before he really begins to break away and go literally over to the British. And this letter says that, thank you, sir, for your letter. I want to wish you and your cause, no, you and your cause, all good success. He didn't say me and you or me and my cause. He said, you, he is separating himself mentally from it. And that's yeah. the beginning of a breakdown that it, it becomes a very involved story, very elaborate over the next several months uh, that will convince him that cause, as he put it, is lost. He wrote a letter in 1780 before he uh, actually is at West Point. And uh, this is a letter that, uh, as I recall, was written to uh, Major Andre, who is uh, uh the main communications link back to the British forces in New York City. And he said, I don't understand why our country is allowing our army to starve. We, we are a land of, of uh, great, you know, great resources. And yet we're allowing this army to starve in the field. It's all wrong. And so he starts to view himself as I got to go back over to convince other people the cause is fundamentally lost. It's a lost cause thing that he does go through. It's hard for us to understand that. We don't because who won? Hey, let me put it this way. The guy guessed wrong. Yeah. Okay. But amazingly enough, the guy who guessed wrong probably did as much as any other rebel patriot to bring about the success because because of his actions, where he was the real leader at Saratoga, ultimately, this will convince the very powerful French to come in officially under the table before, but now officially support the Americans. Treaties are signed. Uh, the French become good and faithful allies, and they will, because they don't really like the English anyway at this point in time, uh, they will actually then provide critical difference in naval forces and additional land forces and supplies. And they really do prove in the end, once they figure out how to work with the Americans, it will all come together in a place called Yorktown, where it really is the French and the Americans with very similar numbers uh, who will begin to end the war by capturing yet another uh, British army um, in 1781, in October 1781. So that's kind of the story. It's in the nutshell. Right. Uh, there's so much more detail there. And that's what we try to do in the documentary. We try to show some of that detail. And we try to make it clear this is a more complex story. And that, that really the theme that we get to is, and we're asking it as a question, we're not necessarily trying to answer people, was Benedict Arnold betrayed by the cause before Benedict Arnold betrayed the cause? Ah, I like that. That would be a good and, starting point for a class, that, too. That's, that's, a, that's a very, very kind of interesting question. I know some people that will not want to accept that Arnold's bad and it's bad. I learned that in school and I'm never going to change my mind. I learned that in school too, but then I did something. I checked out the real record. I went to the archives and I started to find this story that was neglected all the way back to Jared Sparks 
uh, with the original autobiography based on these trumped up stories in the 1830s, carried over and over and over again down to our own time in a variety of uh, Arnold biographies. But I hope my contribution was that I tried to get at the real story. I think that's what historians should be all about. And, I and think uh, that's what I tried to do. What you referenced with going to the archives, those primary sources really are where you find the, the nuts and bolts of the, the history. It's the, yeah, that's it's, right. That's right. You can, you can make a lot of stuff up if you don't have any evidence. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, so uh, a lot of stuff does handle that way. And I, I realize interpretation is what it is. I mean, the standard historical method, we, we define the subject, we go do research, we evaluate that research, and then we present our conclusions. That's a very standard form of historical methodology. Uh, and what I'm so pleased about uh, is that we have actually followed that historical methodology in our Benedict Arnold hero portrayed documentary. So from if there's no other point of view of, or no other way to say this, that's a real contribution in and of itself. It isn't quite the way a lot of people are going to like this story, but it's a real, very realistic look at the reality of the Revolutionary War. Right, absolutely. So you had mentioned a little bit about the filmmaker. So who who are the performers in the in the documentary? Well, we have actually a cast of hundreds who went to different locations over several years. Uh, this was a project of love in many ways. Um, in, in, that, in that sense, uh, uh, we would run out of money. We didn't have any money for a year or two or three years trying to find somebody. You know, you just can't find, like there was a big series in the 1980s. George Washington is presented by uh, General Motors Corporation. Can you imagine? <laughs> Benedict Arnold is presented by Ford Motor Company. Right. <laughs> it's, right. not gonna, it's not going to happen. So it was a lot of love. It was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of just trying to convince people to help out and participate. Participate. We had a lot of reenactors involved, um, and we filmed in different locations, a lot of them in the New York area. Um, Fort Ticonderoga from the air, uh, Fort Stanwix, uh, uh, all the way west in the, in the Mohawk Valley, just to give you some examples. Uh, the Palatine Church, which is along the Mohawk River, which we use as a set um, of part of Arnold's childhood. There was actually, uh, a, there's a, a town, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, it's like a, a, I guess, a, a set, and it's just east of Albany, and we shot some of the more urban scenes, if you want to call them that, in that area, subbing for Philadelphia, and uh, actually, there was actually some shooting that was done at one point in Quebec City itself. So we went all over the place. When there was enough money to do it, we did it. Nice. And we finally uh, found the right person uh, in Martin Sheen, very well-known actor to be the overall narrator, put it all together. And now it's out there and available on those various streaming services. And that list will continue to expand. That is my understanding in the months ahead. Nice. And I, so I'm recommending this. If you really want to, Good look, a realistic look at American history. Try out Benedict Arnold, Hero Betray. Excellent. And I know some other historians that I saw on the website, Thomas Fleming, Carol Birkin. So he seemed to have a lot of other yes. very well-known historians involved as well. That's right. That was what one of the things I did. I tried to contact, and we were able to contact people like Carol Birkin, uh, Thomas, unfortunately, is no longer right, with us. Yeah. Um, he did pass, but he was a tremendously successful writer. We had uh, Mark Lender. We had Charlie Niemeyer, who was uh, one time head of the Marine Corps History Program. Um, these are not these are not uh, uh, small time small time players, and uh, uh, so that. I can say, all I can say is I really appreciate because they gave us the time. We, they were not making any money on this. None of us have really made any money on this. Um, and uh, so it goes back to being what I've already said. It's a, it was a labor of love on the part of a lot of people. Jim Nelson, who James Nelson is a very successful writer, writes wonderful novels and actually some very good history. He's one of our commentators. And uh, 
so I could go on and on and on about those individuals, but um, indeed, um, we can't thank them enough for the time that they were able to share with us. A great group effort, you know, everyone. Absolutely. I mean, historians seem to have their own fan club behind them, and, and if you have a passion, you have the passion, so you're willing to give your time, and just like you're giving your time tonight to talk to us, but just you know, helping each other out and just spreading the love of history so that future generations know the story as well. Like this, this in many ways was not a Hollywood production. And it was with, with scrambling for money. It was without a budget in many ways. It was just to do as much as we could when we had some resources available. Uh, and there was a lot of giving of time and effort on the part of people. Um, and that that's what made it that's what made it possible and that's one of the things i'm personally proud of because in the end it's both done and it's good well i've seen a couple of clips i haven't had a chance one semester just ended and the other one just started so i that's going to be my my treat to myself over our february break but i've seen several clips and they just look fabulous so i i can't wait to watch the whole thing um in mid february so i'm well, I that. would I would highly recommend certain certain scenes. I I mean I can be selective, uh, but uh, to do Valcor, which has almost never been done before, uh, very 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 difficult. There's a lot of shooting in that area, um, and and uh, I don't mean shooting guns. I mean you know shooting with cameras, right. and and uh, uh, then of course you get into the whole thing about how are you going to dramatize the battle itself and that gets into computerization and so on and so forth. Um, I'm particularly uh, uh, proud of the Quebec scenes, that is the failure to take Quebec. I think Saratoga has done very, very well and very realistically. Um, and we do present the tension between Gates and uh, that is General Horatio Gates, who was in overall command. The Congress didn't like Philip Schuyler for some reason, and they were playing politics and they put Gates in charge. Hmm. Uh, Gates wanted the job and Gates actually let Arnold do the dirty work. And then he didn't have any problem taking credit for everything. Um, and so all of that is there, that, that kind of drama is there. Uh, and it's, it's natural. It isn't that we, we didn't have to make this stuff up. That's I mean, the revolution is so full of an amazing array of rich stories uh, and to tell them and uh, to tell them accurately um, and honestly without agenda driven history, which we always are going to have, whether right. we like it or not, um, is a, I think a, real, for lack of a better term, blessing for this nation. Absolutely. I think that's a great way to end this segment. That's a great thought. We'll come back after this message with James Kirby Martin talking about the newly released documentary, Benedict Arnold, Hero Betrayed. We'll be right back after this break. HudsonRiverRadio.com, your local Rockland County station. Hi, this is Mercedes Kent. Join me for the silver screen with Mercedes Kent, a weekly talk show about films, celebrities, and all things entertainment. Big Jim and I will catch you up on the current top 10 in the movie theaters, interview some people in the biz, and fill you in on what is hot. So come have fun with us right here on HudsonRiverRadio.com. Entertainment ensues. Subscribe to The Silver Screen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts. Gail Newcomb from Paranormally Yours here. Seen any weird looking creatures lately? I mean, besides your coworkers, family, and friends. The Hudson Valley actually is said to have its own water monster, and even possibly Sasquatch. Or is it something else? Join me, Gail Newcomb, for Paranormally Yours. We'll be exploring the unexplained and the mysterious from all around the Hudson Valley. Join me for Paranormally Yours on HudsonRiverRadio.com. Subscribe to Paranormally Yours on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or wherever you get your podcasts. HudsonRiverRadio.com, your local Rockland County station. Welcome back to HudsonRiverRadio.com, and let's talk history. I'm your host, Jennifer Lorenzo, and we've been so delighted to have James Kirby Martin joining us tonight, esteemed historian, and played a big role in the newly released documentary, Benedict Arnold, Hero Betrayed. 
So, Jim, the final thoughts on Benedict Arnold. What are your parting words for our listeners? My parting words are that life is complex, I guess is the way to uh, just use a very few words to describe the situation. Arnold led a complex life. He did uh, many, many good things, uh, but it didn't end up well for him. Uh, today, his, his name is scorned, but yet at the same time, he was a heroic figure who helped bring about before he gave up uh, this amazing American Republic that we have. He lived, he grew up in the world of monarchism. And even though he retreated back into that world, what he did as a legacy, he helped establish a true Republic in which the people, rather than a few select leaders and a king or a queen manage everyone's business um, and in that sense, that's an amazing contribution. Think of the French alone. If he didn't do anything else, I know some people think he didn't like the French, but I don't, I'm not so sure about that. I'm, I have a hard time finding that in the record. But he did, by helping to bring the French in, that provides the critical difference that allows the Americans to, often wavering in their own support, it allows them to persist under the really um, the, the strong, so strong leadership of George Washington and persevere, even though it's not a large number of people, they did, and they brought a gift. And that was the new American Republic in a world still dominated by monarchical, tyrannical systems. Absolutely. And they can see all of that in the documentary, the newly released Benedict Arnold Hero Betrayed. And the listeners can see it on uh, Prime Video, Amazon, iTunes, Vudu, Roku, Vimeo. And you said more are going to be added as time yes. goes on. So it's just more opportunities to see the documentary and just to learn more about Benedict Arnold and let present and future generations know his story. Thank you. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Again, James Kirby Martin. The name of the documentary is Benedict Arnold, Hero Betrayed. And um, just great information in the podcast and in the, the documentary. And I encourage all of our listeners to go watch it on the streaming services. So thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you for listening to HudsonRiverRadio.com and Let's Talk History. Find this podcast and all of our other podcasts on your favorite podcast platform on HudsonRiverRadio.com and like us on Facebook, uh, Let's Talk History, and also HudsonRiverRadio.com on Facebook. Have a great night and go out and make history. Take care. History has its eyes on you. History has its eyes on you. HudsonRiverRadio.com Peacock is streaming your favorite shows, movies, live sports, breaking news, exclusive originals, and every live WWE pay-per-view. It's The Office, Chris Lee knows best, and Peacock original shows like Punky Brewster. Peacock, watch for free, upgrade for more. Stream now at PeacockTV.com.